OK, I want to continue with the uh, observer pattern because it turns out observer is not a perfect solution for the problems that we're trying to solve. Let's just briefly review what an observer pattern is very quickly to bring everybody up to speed. And then we'll talk about the limitation for observer. And then we'll introduce you some better design, even better design, which will solve the problems in general. Okay? Let's just quickly review what an observer pattern is. So this is the architectural diagram for the observer pattern for our weather station problem. Okay. Again, for observer pattern over here, sometimes people say publish, subscribe pattern as well. So you have observer over here. Sometimes people say they are subscribers. Also, we got subjects on the other side. Sometimes people also call them publisher. Okay. So now for subjects over here, you have a list of observers. And you can see the static type for every element in the list is of type observer. And then for observer over here is the superclass, it's deferred, which means you cannot create dynamic type uh, out of observer directly. So what you have is you got forecast, you got current conditions, you got statistics. So each one of the observer descendant classes, they depend on some particular part of the data you're observing. Okay? And also for observer, we got update uh, feature, which you have to define. In, for example, the update feature for forecast will be slightly different from the update feature for current conditions. Why? Because forecast only depends on the uh, pressure to see if the pressure has been reduced. On the other hand, for the current condition here, they only they care about a little bit more. They care about the uh, humidity and also the uh, temperature. Okay, so every uh, every observer might be different. Uh, maybe a different part of the data they actually care about. And also, we have to write some good contracts by saying the uh, observer data are actually up to date with the subjects. Now, from the subject side, we also get another inheritance over here. And then for the subject, uh, for weather data, we got temperature, humidity, and pressure. And then make sure you write some good invariants over here to say what really means, what it really means for the weather data to be valid. It should be within the bounds for every measure. Okay? And now, what I really want to point to you is, if you look at this, I want you to focus on this attribute over here, observers over here. Each subject has its list of observers. So that means if I have, I'll give you one example. Let me put it here. If I have subject number one at the runtime, and then I got observer different applications. I got observer one, observer two, and observer three. Let's say these three observers are, are all the observers of subject one. So that means subject one is pointing to here, pointing to here, and pointing to here, okay, like a collection. Okay. Now, if we try to make the problem a little bit more general, let's say, what if we want to add another subject over here? Let's say subject number two. In this case, you, what you learn uh, from 2030, something called aggregation, which means we can share the observers, which means maybe observer one, two, and three, they are also observing what's really available here in subject two as well. So you may have something like subject number two may also point to object one, so observer one, observer two, and observer three. So this is the kind of the more general problem or challenge we're dealing with. Okay? So that's, that's where we should start with from today. Okay? But I'll talk about this diagram a little bit more in just a moment. I just want to give you some warm up. Any question about understanding the architecture for observer over here, subjects and observer? Okay? Any questions? Are we okay? Okay. Now, let's now go over some limitation over here for observer, and then we'll see exactly what the limitation is. Now, observer pattern is actually quite a suitable or reasonable solution for one-to-many relationship, which means one subject and also multiple subscribers. Okay? That's for one-to-many. However, if you try to, try to generalize this, this relation here to many-to-many, -many, which means many subjects and many observers, in this case, you will see that the observer pattern actually has some limitation there. I'll show you why. Okay? Since we are computer scientists, we should really do things scientifically. Okay? So now, let's say we are trying to deal with many-to-many -many relationship. Let's just extend our original weather station problem just a little bit. It used to be that all the observers are observing a single piece of data for weather data, right? So now let's say we extend that a little bit. This is the new problem we are dealing with. Let's say we got multiple weather data, okay? Multiple pieces of data. 
And maybe each data belongs to some particular weather station, just different weather station, different uh, weather data, instead of just one. Okay? That's a new problem here. And then each application can be current condition, statistics, or can be uh, forecast. So they observe all these data, all of them. Okay? And now this is the thing. So now each application, they still store only one copy of the measure. I'll just take one example. Okay, let me just illustrate it to you what I mean by that. Okay, let me just add another page over here. So let's talk about what's really the challenge for the new problem over here. Let's say this. Let's say I got weather data, weather data one, weather data two, okay, weather data three. Let's just make three, so multiple. Let's say I have my, let's say, forecast application. In this new problem here, weather data one is observed by this application. Weather data two is also observed by that. This one is also observed by that. Okay, so that's part of the observer. Let's just make that. Okay, we're just extending the problem a little bit and see how we can deal with it using observer pattern. So now remember for the forecast application, we only store one attribute, which is the uh, pressure. Now, observing three different data doesn't really mean we have to have three different pressures in the uh, forecast application side, not really. The problem we are dealing with is as follows. Let's say at the moment, let's say pressure is simply 60. So that's the latest measure. In this case, as soon as weather data one is updated to 60, it's going to notify the forecast application and then change the pressure to 60. And now let's say the next change will be, let's say weather data three, it changes to maybe 55. And now it's going to notify the same application over here. And then we're going to change from 60 into 55. You can see only one single attributes from the application side, but the update resources might be from multiple weather data. Okay, so that's a new problem we are dealing with. Any question about this illustration here, just before I go on? Okay, it's a different problem than what we uh, solved on Monday, slightly more generalized, in the sense that now for every, um, for every uh, application over here, it, they might be observing different pieces of data rather than just one. Okay, questions, or are you okay? Yeah. WD1, mm -hmm. Mm. No, it doesn't. Because WD2, uh, think, think in this way, good question. Think, think in this way. So now, WD1, WD2, WD3, they are independent subjects. They're independent, which means they don't have to know each other's data. Only the forecast application, which is the observer, it is required that they should really get the latest measure. So which means as soon as I change that to be 55, so that's the latest measure. So I should really update that to be 55 rather than 60. Okay? But between the uh, widest uh, data, they don't have to interfere with each other. Okay. Good. Guys, any questions about this before I move on? Are we okay? That's a new problem. Okay? Right. By the way, we got only one topic today. Okay, so I really want to make sure you understand. If we finish earlier, I can take questions about projects. Okay, but we'll see. Okay, so now let's see, uh, also let's go over all the problem. So now whenever any weather station updates a particular piece of weather data, we want to make sure we notify all the observers, okay, as I illustrated. And then also you want to make sure all the relevant subscribe application, what do I mean relevance? I mean, I will, so relevant here is really important. I will demonstrate that to you. Let's say this, for every weather data, remember, we actually got different, uh, three different uh, measures. Remember we got pressure, also we got humidity, and also we got temperature. As far as the forecast application is concerned, you should only notify this application about the updates if the change was on the pressure. If the change was on either humidity or temperature, there's no need to, to notify the uh, forecast app because if, as far as the forecast op computation is concerned, we only need to know the uh, pressure, right, as we learned from Monday. So that means, let's say for weather data one, if the temperature goes from 60 
down to maybe 55, for example. In this case, we don't have to notify this particular forecast app. We don't have to. Okay, that's something. That's what, what I meant by relevance. Because every observer only observes a particular part or subset of the data. Okay? That's important to realize. You will see when I show you the final solution. So now, how can the observer pattern solve this problem here? So now, before I introduce to you the more, the most generalized solution, let's see how the solution we learned from Monday can help us. And let's see what might be its limitation, okay? Now, the observer pattern is very easy. Basically, if you're observing a data, you just subscribe to it. You just become its part of its observer. Okay, this is principle from Monday. So each weather data maintains a list of subscribe applications, and then also each application is subscribed to multiple weather data. Right? In this case, you can see that over here, you have forecast applications subscribed to weather data one, two, and three. So three multiple sources for updates. Okay? So now, let's now imagine this. Now, I'm going to draw this diagram here. For those of you who don't have access to the slide, that would be great because I can test some of your knowledge from 2011. Okay? We are drawing graph. Okay? Let's just try this. Let's imagine a little bit more abstractly. Let's say I got weather data. Let me just use a different color here. I got weather data one, weather data two, and all the way to, let's say, weather data n minus one, weather data n. So that means how many weather data do I have n? Okay? So this is from the subject side. I got n different weather data. Okay, that's from the subject side. Now, let's talk about from the observer side, how many applications do we have? Let me just make some example here. Let's say I have, let's make it also completely general. Let's say I got application one, application two, and all the way to application n minus one, application uh, just n. So this means I have n applications. Now, based on the principle I just mentioned on the slides, which means each application is subscribed to multiple weather data, right? In this case, let's say we're going to, each application is going to observe every one of them, the weather data. In this case, how complex would the diagram be, the graph? N times M, very good. Wow, I'm very good, exactly. Let me, for those of you who don't quite follow, let me just illustrate. But M times N is exactly correct. Okay. For example, you can see that, let me use a different color here. So now for weather data one, it should be observed by application one, application two, and all the application over here. Right? And similarly, we also have over here, 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 and also here, right? So how many arrows do we have? Exactly what you guys just said. It will be exactly n multiplied by n. So that will be the complexity of the links we have to somehow maintain at the runtime. Okay? So that's exactly what you will see on the uh, slide over here. Okay? That's in general, right? depending on how many observer and how many uh, weather data you have or you, for your particular application. Any question about this? Are we okay? Okay. Now, now that we know what the problem is, let's just go over that very quickly. So that's the runtime, and then we know that it's going to be big O of uh, the multiplication of the two, uh, two, the size of two sides. Now, what we really want to do, the general solution to this, the ultimate solution for this kind of problem here is we want to have event-driven design. Okay, what do I really mean by event-driven design? Here is the insight. Okay, let me just show you the diagram first. So now let me just uh, switch the iPad over here. Let's say we talk about just since we got three different measures over there for every observer to measure, to observe, uh, temperature, uh, pressure, uh, and also the, uh, and pressure, right? So we got hu uh, humidity. So we got three different measures over there. Let's say we just talk about temperature for now. Let's focus on temperature, okay? So now in this case, what we're going to introduce a new concept is something called events over here. 
So we're gonna say that everything that's going to be observed, every variable that is that is going to be observed is called an event. And the way this works is, is, is as follows. So we no longer have any subject or uh, observer anymore. We only got a notion about either publisher or subscriber. What well, in some way, like a subject and observer as before, but it's different. Let's see this. Let's say we talk about this particular data over here, which is temperature, okay? The way we do this is fundamentally different from before. We're saying that whoever can really update this temperature over here, you see all the weather station data, right? In that case, they have to publish into this particular event. And then once this, uh, whenever there's any updates on this event, they will actually notify all the subscribers on the other side for the application, as you can see from the diagram. Is it clear just from the diagram? Can you see what's going on here? Okay. So let me just repeat again. So here's the principle, the new principle. Now for every variable, we're going to declare that as an events. Events simply means you can update the events or you can notify the updates of the events, either way, okay? Now for every application over here, they will be subscribed to this particular events. And then for every weather data over here, used to be the subjects, they can publish some updates into the events, okay? So now all we gotta do is, we're just gonna make sure uh, both ends are maintained the links rather than having the uh, m times n links. In this case, what has the complexity become? Over here. n plus n. n, plus n. Very good, hopefully that's obvious to you. It's simply how many subjects you have plus how many subscriber you have. It's a dramatic uh, improvement uh, on the on the performance, well, on the complexity. So basically, uh, another principle for design, the simpler, the better. You don't need to make it unnecessarily complicated. Okay, just to test your knowledge very quickly. Again, when you are trying to make your design, also think about how complicated it would be to make some extension, okay? Now, question number one. Let's say I want to add a weather station, a weather data. How much would it cost? according to this new mechanism. If I want to add a new subject on the left-hand side, like let's say weather data n plus one, right? Constant, right? Why would that be constant though? Okay, let's uh, go back to the diagram over here. You can see that if I want to add a new subject, like a weather data, what I need to do is simply, let me just erase this, okay? It's no longer needed. Okay, now let's talk about extension. If I want to add a new weather data, let's say this is weather data and then n plus one. In this case, as soon as this is done, so if in the old observer pattern, I need to make sure this is observed by every application, but now in the new design, I don't have to. I simply say, this is now going to publish to this particular events, and that's it. Okay, that's why it's constant, okay? now. A similar question here, hopefully you can also see that. What about, I want to add a new observer. Would that be constant as well? Okay. That would be constant because if you look at that, you will see that if I add a new application over here, and now application, by the way, that should be n plus one, not n. Application is n plus one. In this case, I don't have to make, I don't need to really say this application is going to subscribe to every weather data on the left hand side, I don't have to. In the new mechanism over here, I can simply say this new observer is gonna to subscribe to the new event over here. And that's it. That's why it's constant, okay? That's why it's also constant. One more question. What if I want to add a new event? Let's say we used to measure humidity, pressure, and temperature. Let's say we want to measure maybe uh, another variable, I'm not sure. So maybe uh, what about density, for example? Another variable. In this case, how much would it cost to add this density variable to the diagram? How much? In terms of big O. Would it be constant? Uh, Andre, you wanna try? Are you talking about adding your hardware again? Yes, uh, let me, how about, let's make it more visual for you and then you can tell me. Let's say I want to add a new event over here. Let's say just like that. I can say change on, 
density, for example. And then there's just another event. Let's say I'm introducing this new event. This new event is going to, uh, going to mean that the density might change as we observe. In this case, how do I add this to the diagram? How much would it cost? N plus N, exactly. Because, for example, in this one, of course, that'll be more expensive than the previous two operations. In this case, I gotta make sure all the weighted data over here is gonna point to here, right? And also, all the application are going to subscribe to this particular event. So that's more costly if I add a new event. Okay? Okay, any question until now, just about the conceptual design over here? And then I'm gonna show you gradually how this works. But I should really know that the main motivation to go from observer into this new event-driven design is really these two diagram changes. We go from the complexity of m multiplied by n into m plus n. So that's why we're going there, okay? Okay, let's now see the next slide. Now, let's just briefly talk about what event-driven design really means, and we talk about what you require to implement that, and then I'll show you both Java version and Eiffel version for you to, for your knowledge, and then we'll compare to see how things can be done differently. The concepts are really the same. It's just the syntax is a little bit different, okay? We can, we can see which one is more convenient. Okay, now, let's just go uh, over a little bit background about event-driven design. Basically, each variable, like a pressure, temperature, that you're trying to observe is called a monitor variable, so they're being monitored, okay, just some term. Let's take some real-life example. You know the uh, uh, OPG Ontario power generation, they got some mo uh, nuclear power plant somewhere. So now, for the nuclear power plant, so usually they got at least two measures there. One is called temperature, the other one is called pressure, again, right? Uh, like internally. So now, there would be some uh, shutdown system, which means they have to observe constantly how the uh, temperature and, measure, uh, and pressure change, and they are the observer. In this case, how, how, how does the thing work in, in, in terms of the observer pattern? In this case, we say that as soon as the values of these monitor, monitor variable, if they, let's say if the temperature goes too high, in this case, the shutdown system will be notified about the changes. In that case, the updates they should do is to shut down the power plant. Right, so that's how, that's how the things work. Okay, yep, just another example here. Now, what we're gonna do in the event-driven design is we're going to represent each monitor variable, can be pressure, can be humidity, and can be uh, uh, density. So each monitor variable is going to be an event. Okay, the event can be subscribed, and the event can be published. Okay, so the, uh, the, the, there are two possible operations you can do on the events. Okay, so now let's just go over what, what, uh, how it works informally. So we have observer here. Observer is now attached and subscribed, not to the subject anymore, okay? They are actually subscribed to the relevant events. For example, let's say for the, uh, for the forecast application, because all, the only relevant variable for forecast would be the temperature. In that case, they only have to subscribe to the uh, temperature events, okay? So it's actually said here. For current conditions, they only subscribe to temperature and humidity, okay, only two events. And for forecast, only for pressure. And also for statistics, only for temperature, okay, et cetera. Okay. And for the subjects, they don't have to notify individual observer anymore. All they gotta do is they notify the event to say, now we, I do have updates. And then the event is going to somehow notify its uh, subscribed uh, applications, okay? Again, what you should really understand is this diagram here. So that's exactly how the mechanism works. Okay. Any questions until now, before I move on to some requirements? Up to now, it's only concept, but how do we implement this, right? The main thing about implementing this is as follows. Let me just go back to the diagram, okay? So now, over here, let me just add a new pay, uh, Let's just add a new diagram here to explain. Okay, let me just go for this one here. Again, this is the event-driven design mechanism over here. So now, let's say this. Whenever, when I say application one, when I say application number one, 
subscribe to uh, let me just call this E1, okay, just for short, okay, to E1. So what does that mean? When you subscribe to something, you're going to provide some information, okay? What we used to do in the observer pattern, we simply just attach the current object like this. That's what we did on Monday. But now we're going to attach something more, okay? So what, what we actually attach is going to be some pointer, okay, I would say attach, pointer to some update function. So over here, this idea here should not be new to you, pointer to some update function. This is what you learned in 2031, pointer to function, okay? So rather than calling the updates when necessary, we simply pass a reference or pointer to some function and then delay the execution. We let the event to decide when to really execute that operation. So that's really the key, okay? So when you, when application one is trying to get subscribed to E1, it passes itself, and also it passes some update operation, but not to execute it, but only the reference to it. So that means e, later on, when there's any updates from the uh, subject side, in that case, as soon as there's any updates that's published to events, the event can call that uh, earlier subscribed uh, function. Okay, that's kind of the idea, but we'll see that, okay? So that's the most important point for this uh, mechanism, okay? Let me just finish the other half of the story. So this is about the subscribe part. When there is an updates from, for example, weather data one, okay? It will publish to E1, the same events over here. And what does it really mean to publish the updates? That means E1, in turn, is going to calling the, I would say, saved update operation. Okay? So you can think of, when we first subscribe, we actually save the update operation over here, just temporarily. We don't really call that yet. So as soon as the weather data actually send the updates over here, we can call that. Okay, so we just, it's the reference there. Okay, let's see how that works. Let's go over some slides over here. So now, what's the requirements for implementing event-driven design? That's exactly what I said. You need to have a way to support pointer to function. Okay, we do have a way, okay? So when the observer object subscribes to an event, it attaches two things, as I said. First of all, you should attach the reference or pointer to some update operation. Okay? You can think of what we said uh, on Monday about the updates. For example, the update feature for the current conditions is going to update the temperature and the humidity. Now, rather than executing that feature directly, we're going to pass a reference to it, to the events. Okay? Well, that's something you will see. And also, we're going to delay the execution because when we pass the reference, we don't have to execute it right away. Okay, that's the beauty about uh, pointer to function. And then we also got to pass itself because whenever you want to call an update feature, since we support object orientation, you want to know what the context object is. Okay, so that's really important, two things. What about the subjects? Since the uh, pointer has been saved in the event side, so you can call that whenever necessary. So when we want to call it, that's when the subject actually publish some update to the events, the same events, okay? In this case, it's going to iterate through all the observers for the events, uh, and then it's going to just call that particular operation that's saved. Okay? Again, this is just informal. We're going to see some exact coding for you to see. Okay? But that's why I'll show you both versions in Java and iPhone. Okay, so now, basically number one and number two. So these are the two implementation requirements. If your language cannot really simulate these two scenarios, in your programming language. In that case, you cannot support this event-driven design, okay? But luckily, for iPhone and Java, we do support them, but in a slightly different way, okay? But the ideas are really the same. So now, we're gonna see how we can implement the event-driven design for both iPhone and Java, okay? Let's compare them, okay? I'll do Java first, okay? And then, this is my conclusion first. You'll find that it's actually much more convenient to do this design in iPhone, but I'll show you why, okay? So first of all, the, 
this particular implementation I presented uh, may not be the best. If you actually got a either even need to design, do let me know. I'm willing, uh, willing to improve that, but that should be reasonable. Okay, let's see. First of all, this is the cloud. So now we talk about Java. Everything is Java for now. I'll remind you when we go back to iPhone. Okay, just for the first part, it's just Java. Let's say we have a clause called events, and all the source code is also available on the course website. You can also download and play, play with them. So let's say we have a class called events. So this is the class where we're going to create instances so we can subscribe or publish to it. So that means in the event class, we're going to define publish and subscribe. And let's see how we do that. The main idea is we're going to use a class called method handle. It's more about reflection, which means you can get the reference for a particular method and save it somewhere, and then invoke that method later. Okay, that's kind of the mechanism we want to support. Okay, let's see that. Now, I want you to pay very special attention to this one over here. I call this listeners and actions. Okay? Remember, for me to do a Java method call, what do I need? I need a method name, I need the arguments, and also I need the targets of the uh, method call. Okay? Let me just make it explicit to you over here. So now, if I want to do a method call, this is general form, O dot N, and then arc. Okay? That's a general form for method call, or feature call in iPhone. So I call this the context objects. And of course, this is the name of the method. That one is no surprise. And this is the arguments. Okay? You should know this very well. Now, if I say I do want to make this particular method call, but not now. I want to delay that for later. So that means I need to somehow save this information somehow to the events. But how do I do that? Okay? You will see that the way we save this kind of information here is different in Java and in iPhone. But the same information has to be stored. Okay? Let's see how we do that in Java. In Java, it's very naive in some way. We're going to say, we're going to store the current object over here in Java. Store the current objects. And we're going to also store the method information. And I'll show you how you can get it using some reflection in Java. Okay? So these are the two pieces of information you're going to store. That's why I simply got some hash table over here. Okay? The hash table over here simply means, so this object over here is the key. So that's going to be the context object we have. So we assume that we got unique observers over here. Okay? So that's the observer objects. And the method handle is just a library class that we import from Java language package. In this case, method handle is going to be like a pointer to the method. You can think in that way. So you got every information you need for execution. Okay? I just call that listeners and actions. So you have both. Both the listeners and the actions. Now, for the constructor for the event, I simply just initialize an empty hash uh, table. Okay? And then, how do I subscribe? If I want to subscribe to this event over here, as I said, I need two pieces of information. I need the current objects. I'm talking about the context objects, which is object over here and also the method information, like a pointer to the method. Now, in this case, what I will do is I simply say the hash table that put listener and action. Okay, that's how I subscribe. Okay, guys, any questions? Are we okay? okay. Now, how do I publish? In this case, if I want to publish the result, what does that mean? Let's just go back to the diagram very quickly. Let's say this Let's say there is some updates over here from this subject over here to the events. Now the events would like to publish the uh, updates to all the relevant application, all the observers. How do we do that? It's very easy. Basically, just retrieve the method definition or the method pointer from the hash table and call that. Conceptually, it's very easy. Let's see how we can do that. Now, we run a for each loop. We can say for each listener for this particular event. Remember, each event has all the relevant listeners. For every listener for this particular event, so we're going to do the following. First of all, let's retrieve the pointer to that, uh, so action over here is the update action for that particular listener. Okay? Retrieve the uh, method handle, the pointer. And then we're going to call this method here. So we say, whatever action it is, Invoke with arguments. Again, so these are all the library methods I'm, I'm uh, calling. You can certainly look at the API to see what, what they're supposed to do. And then I also, okay, see this is a call target. And then let me just, uh, so this line here is equivalent to the following. This line here is simply equal to 
listener dot action arguments is equivalent to that. It's just that we did that dynamically. Okay. Any question about this line here? Okay. Have you guys used that before in your previous course? Maybe. Yes. Okay. If no, they are learning something new. I hope. And then. You may ha you also have to do a try and catch because in case if there's anything wrong, for example, if the method you're finding is not there, in that case you gotta catch some exception. That's because the ex exception is unchecked, so you really gotta check it. Oh, sorry, it's check exception, so you gotta check it. Okay, so now what I really want to, uh, let me just emphasize again in line number five over here, we simply put a listener, the context object, and the action uh, like a pointer to the method than for the uh, uh, updates. So that means we store them for later execution. It's delayed, okay? It's in line number, five, line number five. In line number 11, whenever we want to publish the updates, so now is the time to execute that delayed action. That's why that's when we call that, okay? So this is the event. A very simple API over here. We only support subscribe and publish. Okay, so these are the two, two things. And then we'll see that how the uh, subjects and the observer is gonna interact with them, okay? Okay, let's see weather data. Remember weather data is from this end. Okay, weather data is over here, so that's a subject. Let's see how the subject is going to be able to publish to over here. Let's see that, this, uh, this side over here. So weather data over here. So again, we got temperature, we got pressure, we got humidity. And then weather data is gonna have some initial uh, measurements, temperature, uh, pressure, and humidity, okay? And also you can see that the methods over here are exactly the same as what we said on Monday. So this is basically the same example, just with some extension. Now, this is really important over here. So what does this mean? So we are saying that because we know that the weather data is somehow going to be observed by many observers eventually or at the runtime. So what we, the way the way we declare that this event over here is on the subject side. We say that in the weather data over here, we know that each variable, as I said before, is going to correspond to a separate events. In this case, there's going to be one event for temperature, one event for pressure, and one event for humidity. So what does that mean? That means if the temperature changes, that means only we have to publish the, for the event corresponding to temperature, but not the other two, okay? That's important. So that's why you will see that we declare three events over here, okay? Let's pause a little bit. You really want to see line number eight, nine, and 10. This is really critical on the subject side. So you can see on the subject side, we no longer maintain any observers. Somehow the observer is maintained on the event, not really on the subject. You can see line number eight, we declare one event called change on temperature, which means whenever there's any change on the temperature, we're gonna publish to this particular event, okay? And for any application who's interested in le learning about temperature, they should subscribe to this particular event, okay? Okay, good. Now, let's see what else. And then, let's say this. Now, we can also change the measurements over here. So now, let's see what we should do. In line, line number 11, we are trying to define a mutator over here. We say that now, maybe the weather station has observed some new measures. So it's gonna modify this particular weather data. So it's gonna set a measurement to be new uh, T, H, and P. So we simply assign T to be the new temperature, H to be the new humidity, and P to be the pressure. Now, according to this mechanism here, what should we do? Let's say we talk about this particular weather data over here. If T, P, and H have changed, what should we do? According to the diagram, we should publish, right? And how many events should we publish? Three, Three right? Event for T, event for P, event for humidity as well. That's exactly what you will see over there, okay? Okay, we're gonna say change on temperature to publish. Okay, again, why would this line compile? First of all, you can see change on temperature over here is of type events. In the previous slides, we do have the publish method defined for events. That's why it makes sense, okay? 
So the subjects in the observer, they're gonna share the same events. And because that's why we declare the event to be static. So it's, the, it's gonna be shared by all the uh, instances, okay? But in IFO, we're gonna do a slightly different way, which is use the once keyword, as we learned from the singleton pattern, okay? Similar idea. Okay, so now we got set measurement here, so that's why you will see we're gonna publish to the change on temperature events. And the, the, the thing we publish is the new temperature. And then we should also publish to the change on humidity events. And the number we give is humidity. And also we publish to the change on pressure events and also we give the pressure. Okay? And that's the code for the subject in this case, the weather data. Any questions? So far you're okay, right? Not really completely lost. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Ah, you, so ba the question was about concurrency. I would say, in this case, I'm trying to uh, simplify the uh, uh, matter over here. Let's say the concurrency has been resolved at a previous level, which means we are guaranteed exclusive access at this point. Of course, you can also uh, maybe do some threading or try to do some transactional memory to make sure you always got no race condition, right? But let's not worry about that. IFO code, yes. Yeah, for now we just assume there's no concurrency issue, yes. But in IFO also, since we don't really cover uh, threading, they also got something similar to threading, but we just don't cover that in this course, yeah. Okay, very good question. But for this example here, and for this course, we assume there's no race condition for concurrency, okay? Okay, so now the more complicated part is gonna be on the observer side. Think about it in this way, why? For each observer, what they're gonna do is they don't publish, they subscribe. When they subscribe to the events, they have to pass themselves, that one's easy, just this. They also need to pass the information of the update method. That one's gonna be challenging, well, tricky, I would say. Okay, took me uh, maybe a couple of hours last night to get it to work. Okay, now, let's see this. Let's just use one class over here. We got current conditions, we got statistics, we also got uh, forecast, let's just use one. The other two will be the same, okay? Now, current conditions. First of all, we have these two private attributes. We got temperature, we also got humidity, right? Nothing surprising. Now, let's say, let's define how can we update the uh, temperature. In this case, we simply say, give me some new temperature as parameter, I just update that. That one's easy, right? So you can imagine that somehow this parameter here is going to come from the event when they publish, okay, basically. And then also, how do we update the humidity? We also take some humidity as parameter and then update that. Now, this is the most complicated method for the whole example. Now, how do we create a new instance of the uh, observer? Basically, thinking this way, let me just again go back to the diagram. Let's say I'm creating an object for application number one. When I'm creating it, I should really pass a reference. I should really somehow subscribe to this particular event. That's what I should do. But as I said before, you should pass two things. First of all, you gotta pass the pointer to some update function over here. I also gotta pass itself. Let's see how we do that, okay? Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use something called method handles, okay? Handles, method handles are lookup, and then lookup, okay, you can uh, read the code, okay? Now basically, we're gonna use this lookup variable over here to look up the method in the same class, which is, for example, update temperature over here, okay? Let's see how we do it. I'll show you the code, and then we'll discuss that if you got any trouble. Now, again, we're gonna do try and catch because if the uh, method is not there, somehow you make any mistake, you're gonna throw some exception, and this exception has to be checked. That's why we need to try and catch. Now, the method I'm gonna need is, I say method handle, I say UT, UT standing for updates for temperature, okay? Let's now try to look up for this update temperature over here. How do we look it up, okay? I'm gonna say look up the find virtual. And then, first of all, I'm gonna say this method here belongs to the current class. That's why I can say this.get class. You can also say current conditions.class. That also work, okay? And the second one I need to give is, the name of the method, updates temperature. You can see the name over here is exactly the name over here, okay, the name. And then the third one is the trickiest. 
The third one is I need to give the return type and also the argument type. Okay. So now in this case, because update temperature is void, return type is void. And also it takes only one parameter, which is type double. That's why you will see something like this. I'm going to create something called method type, and then this is a return type, and then this is the parameter, just one single parameter. Okay. So you can see this is how we can look up a single method from a particular class. That's how we can do it with also the try and catch surrounding. Okay. Any question about this? This one here. Okay. Now, once we got ut over here, you can think of ut right now is a pointer to this particular update temperature method. Okay. Now, how can we pass that okay, to subscribe? What we do is we simply say, Weather data, which is a class we defined previously, and because change on temperature is a static event, we can call that and say subscribe. And then we can pass two pieces of information. We got this, and also we got the method reference, right? Now I'll give you a little bit preview. In the iPhone version, you will you might like iPhone for this particular design more because you can see from line number eight to line number eleven, there's only a single line you need to write in iPhone only a single line. And you don't need e even a try and catch. I'll show it to you. But the concept is really the same. You want to look up the reference for the method and pass that. Okay? Go ahead. What's line 10? Line 10? Uh, sure, no problem. You mean this line here, right? Okay. So basically, you, uh, let me just go back to the beginning. So here, this is the uh, context class for the method, right? And this is the name of the method. And this one here, but first of all, return type. So in this case, you can see that update temperature returns void. That's why I put void that class over here. And then you're going to enumerate all the parameters. In this case, you have only one single parameter, which is double. That's why I say double that class, right? That's why. OK, good question. OK, now, in this case, because for this particular current conditions class, we are interested in two different monitor variables. What we just did was we just get registered for temperature events. We should also get ourselves registered for humidity events. We're going to do something very similar. Okay? We're going to say now, use the same lookup facility, we're going to look up something called UH, update for humidity. Right? So now we'll find virtue again, the same class, different name, update humidity. And then the signature looks very similar, right? Because uh, update humidity takes uh, only double and also returns void. You can see it returns void over here and also it takes double. Okay? After this, we can now pass the current object and UH, the method reference, in order to subscribe. Okay? Guys, any questions? Are we okay? I thought introducing Java version first maybe a little bit easier, I thought. For, for you to see, in some way, I tell you what, it's actually interesting to compare how, how the two languages are going to deal with the same thing. In some way, there are many things IFA will do for you automatically. But for Java, you have to do everything yourself, all the complete details. But, of course, that's a matter of choice. Go ahead, yes. Yeah. Good question. So question was, again, this line here. So method type, you can look up, is also a library class, right? So basically, method type has a static method called method type. It's actually for you to construct something that can represent a type or signature of a method. Yeah, just, uh, you know, again, it's programming details, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, also you're going to do try and catch surrounding, and then you can print, print out a stack trace if you want to. And then finally, you can, you can also display the result. You can just print out the uh, attribute value. Again, the most important method is this one here, how you can initialize a uh, current conditions application. That's the most important part. Okay. Guys, any questions before I move on? Um, I'm not sure because we can def definitely try. How about this? You can do it, make a working version as uh, presented to me. If that's simpler, I'll definitely use it. That was my best try yesterday, you know, just to get something working. Yeah. 
But I think it uh, doesn't matter which uh, library class you use, you gotta pass similar information. You, can, you cannot get around to be two. But you know, feel free to try, please. I encourage you to try. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if no questions, I will move on. I believe, you know what, if you also want to try, I believe rather than method handles over here, you can also use method. There's another class called method. The older, old-fashioned reflection mechanism. You can also try that. Okay. Okay. Now, final class to show in the Java version. Now we got weather station. How now how do we see the event-driven design is gonna work? So now let's say weather station here. Let's say we, we got weather data over here. Let's say it's one single subject and one single observer. Make things easy. But I can easily see that how I can extend it to be multiple subjects and multiple observers. You just keep subscribing and keep publishing. Now let's say we got current condition here. And now one thing you should notice is as soon as you try to call the constructor for current conditions here, what do we do? According to the previous slide, we are going to subscribe twice, right? We're gonna subscribe this CC, this new, uh, in line number four over here, as soon as, we, as soon as we create this new instance here, we're gonna subscribe CC into the temperature change events and also humidity change events, both. Okay, that's what the constructor would do. Okay? And then, let's say we try to say WD, the weather data, the set measurement, which means we are trying to change it. Okay, let's review very quickly what a set measurement will do. Okay, very quickly. If you go back to set measurement over here, you can see that set measurement will publish, right, the updated data to all the uh, uh, relevant events. Okay, now, so now you can see that uh, over here. Okay, again, in line number four, when you first created an application object, it's going to get subscribed to the relevant events one event or multiple events. And then whenever you try to say subject, in this case, weather data, the set that do, doing some updates, in this case, is going to publish to the relevant events for the updated uh, value, okay? And then whenever you publish, it's going to go over all the observers for that particular events and then call the delayed pointer to function, right? Call that and then do the updates. Okay, and you will see that. And then one more thing to say, in line number four over here, when you first create it, it's gonna say, you're gonna call this particular event, for example. So let's say the uh, current condition is only interested in the uh, temperature. In this case, it's gonna call that event and then subscribe itself, right? You can see the CC itself over here. And also, I just put it informally to say, somehow you got a handle like or a pointer to that particular method, okay? In line number six, over here, we are trying to change the states of the subjects. In this case, what we will do is we're gonna publish. In this case, since we are passing 15 over here, right? You can see 15 over here. And that means we're gonna publish 15 into the events. And the event is going to call the update method for CC and then pass 15 to it. That's exactly what's gonna happen. So you will see that whatever the handle is, and then you're gonna call CC with 15. So that's kind of chain of effects that's gonna happen either for the event-driven design. Guys, any question about the Java side? Okay, if no question, let's see the Eiffel side. Okay, let's see uh, if things will be maybe making more sense to you or the other way around. Let's see the Eiffel side. There will be only a, a, a two new syntax I have to introduce to you, but they are straightforward, okay? So now, first of all, uh, let's, again, uh, let's talk in the same sequence as in Java. Let's define the event class in Eiffel. So now we are switching to Eiffel, no, no longer Java. But we'll do a final comparison at the end. So now for the event class over here, so this syntax over here is not unique to Eiffel. So in Java, if you try to say, uh, oh, I'll give you one example. So this is called constraint generosity. I'll give you one example here. Let's say in Java, you want to do something like this. In Java, and I'll show also how you can do in iPhone. Let's say in Java, I say I have one class, let's say sortable array or sortable sequence. Sortable sequence over here, I can say I have some type E over here. 
But now I want to make sure every element there is comparable, right? So what I can say is I can say extends comparable. Something like that. That's what I can say in Java. Similarly, so that means every element in the collection. Remember that this is generic parameter, which means you might instantiate this parameter by any class. In this case, for example, person, or it can be account. However, the fact that we say extends comparable that requires every class you use instantiate over here must be a descendant class of comparable. Okay, that's for Java. And got similar concept in iPhone. Okay, just different syntax. What about in iPhone? In iPhone over here, we'll say class sortable array, sortable sequence over here. And now, rather than angle bracket, we say square brackets. Now we can say G. Now, rather than extends, we say the following, dash, and then larger than, like a pointing arrow. And then I can say comparable. That's what I can say. Okay, Sim the same concept, just different syntax. Okay, it's something called constrained generosity. Constrained generosity. Okay, constrained. Okay, I also got some description uh, on the slide. I'll go over that with you in just a moment. Okay, so now this means, so now argument, let's assume there's no such class. Okay, or you can imagine it's simply just G. Okay. An argument is going to be some generic parameter which can be instantiated by anything. However, now the anything is not just really anything. It's actually something that must be a descendant class of tuple. This, okay, I'll give you some intuition. In iPhone over here, in this case, tuple is going to be used for arguments of your feature or your method. Because you, for your feature, you might have more than one argument. In this case, how do you collect them together? Tuple. As you learned uh, before, you know how tuple works. You can store elements of different types. Okay, we got a constructor over here. So now one thing very important to note. You can see that here we have linked list of procedure of arguments. So procedure over here is a library class in iPhone. Okay. I, I want to draw your attention to how we did the corresponding line in Java. I would point, point you there. Let's go to the Java side. Again, look at line number two. This is the corresponding line. Let's review again what this does. On the event side, what we did was we got a hash table. And hash table is going to store two things together. It's going to store the action, the pointer to function, and also the current, the context objects, right? So two things. However, in I on the IFO side, it encapsulates these two information into a single class called procedure. Okay, that's why you only see procedure on the Eiffel side. But it's really the same thing. Okay? Just that on the Eiffel side, you're going to separate the two things into method handle and also objects. So these are two separate concepts. But in Eiffel, you simply wrap them into a single class called procedure. Okay? That's the uh, uh, difference. Well, you can say that's easier in Eiffel, or you can say just more compact. Okay, let's go back to Eiffel, and then let's see. So now Eiffel number one over here. Okay, that's what we have. So procedure and also procedure which will take some argument type, okay, which is tuple. Okay? I'll get there in just a moment. And then when you first construct a new event, you simply just create an empty actions. Oh, also notice one thing. The way I named this, I simply say actions rather than listeners actions because we don't store listeners explicitly in this case. We don't. It's somehow encapsulated within procedure. Okay? And now, again, we're going to define subscribe and also publish. So this part will be very similar to what we did in Java, very similar. Okay? So now, no syntax is new anymore, okay? uh, except for agents, which I will show you in just a moment. How do we subscribe to this particular event? Easy, because we, uh, we can simply, uh, first of all, we make sure that the actions is not already there. And then we can simply extend the actions with this new action, okay? just the, the same type. Okay, subscribe is easy. So what about publish? Publish means we're going to retrieve what we stored before, the delay action, and then call that with the arguments. So how do we do that? In this case, we already got the argument here, and I've also made it quite easy for you. 
So we can say from, so what you're kind of familiar with this kind of syntax for iterating through the list. So we're gonna go through the action list and then actions.item is going to give you a procedure. And then for procedure there is a support simply called call. It's a little bit similar to call with arguments for method handle, similar, okay? And then just call that with the arguments over here. Okay, and that's it. You know, I would say up to now, iPhone and Java are pretty much similar. It's only a matter of syntax. The ideas are really the same. Okay. The only thing you may want to uh, you may want to notice is just that in the case of the uh, iPhone side, you just say procedure rather than separating between current objects and also the uh, uh, action, just all together. Okay, so we talk about constraint generosity. So whatever you instantiate this argument over here must be a descendant class of tuple. Okay, as I explained. Okay, and then. Oh, you can see in line number four over here, you can also contrast with what we did before as a hash table on the Java side, okay? Now, let's see the weather data. So this is the subjects. Let's see how we can publish the updates. Now, for weather data over here, first of all, we got temperature, humidity, and pressure, the same as before. And also, correct limits and the constructor, same as what we said on Monday, so I don't, just don't repeat them, okay? Now, what about event for data changes? In the case of Java, we simply declare static variables of the event type. We do something similar. Basically, for efficiency reason, we don't have to create brand new event objects every time. We can just return just the same type, just one single reference, like a singleton, what we did before. So you will simply see that, again, change on temperature, I just changed back to the iPhone naming style. Change on temperature of type events, and then, change on humidity of type events, and also change on pressure, also events, the same as before. Now, the only thing is, event is generic, right? Remember, in the previous slides, when you look at event over here, it, it's gonna take one single arguments type. And now, the type we are passing over here to instantiate arguments is simply just a tuple, right? In the case of the change on temperature, we simply say that whatever update feature you will give to me as a pointer, that particular feature is gonna take only a single argument, just a real number, temperature, humidity, or pressure, okay? That's what you will see over here, okay? You may wanna go over this a little bit, maybe I can take a question next Monday, okay? Okay, now, what about set measurements? Set measurements means we're gonna change the uh, temperature, uh, pressure, and also humidity. Now, what should we do? We should publish to the events as what we did in Java. In this case, we're gonna say, well, precondition as we did before, and now set the uh, temperature, pressure, and humidity. Now, let's publish to those relevant events so that they can in turn update the relevant observers. Now, we simply say change on temperature, which is event type, and then say publish. Okay, the same as before. The only thing is, notice that I don't simply say T, because in general, your saved method or saved feature might take more than one argument. In this case, you may have to put a tuple of size more than one. In this case, just one argument, so that's why it's T. Uh, for tuple, because this will have two different No, tuple actually is very general. It can be either zero, one, or two. It's just that what we did before, I give you two. Okay, now let's, okay, that was a good question. So now, how do we use tuple? Again, tuple in IFO over here, you can say T is of type tuple. That's valid. You can say, okay, T1. T2 is of type tuple. In this case, for example, real number. T3 is of type tuple. In this case, maybe I have real and then real. You can be as many as you like, from zero up to without any bound. Okay, so now in this particular context for the event-driven design, depending on how large the tuple is, that means how many arguments your feature is going to take. Okay? Huh? Nothing. Nothing. You know, I tell you what, a special case. You, you might have a mutator or accessor in the Java sense, which takes no arguments. In that case, you pass an empty tuple. Just nothing, yeah. Like an empty array, you know. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now, also you're gonna publish to this uh, change on humidity, 
Also, you're going to publish to change on pressure as well. Okay? You can see the pattern for the code is very similar to what we did in Java, right? And then we got the invariance. Number three, this used to be the most complicated class we had in the Java case because we got to use the method handle, lookup, and also pass all the dot class reflection mechanism. In IFO, no, we don't do that. Let's see. Okay. So now, let's say for current conditions here, again, we, we have something called, uh, we just try to make some weather data here. So that's how we uh, link to it. So now, this is how we subscribe. Now, you can see that this line over here, let, let me tell you which line this will come, uh, correspond to. Let's read this line first. We say that weather data over here, it declares an event's change on temperature. First of all, let's see that very quickly. You can see that change on temperature, that was declared from the previous slides, right? And then we say that WD dot change temp on temperature and then subscribe, right? So now, in the Java case, what we used to pass, we pass two things. We pass this and also the handle, right? In Java case, only one thing you gotta do. You can simply give the name of the feature for updates and then simply do agents. Agent is a little bit similar to what you learned in 2031, the percent address operator. You just pass the pointer to the function, okay, agent. If you, I think you have been using this agent a lot, but just without knowing why, when you write your, J, uh, write your e spec tests, right? So now, that's, that's it. Now, I want to, again, draw your uh, attention to the contrast. This line over here, basically, we try to subscribe using just agent update temperature. This corresponds to, let's just go back to the Java version. If I go to Java version three over here, it corresponds to, as I said before, from line number eight to line number 11. Okay? That's what you had to do in Java, eight, nine, 10, 11. But in IFO, just one single line, as I said before. Okay, so now let's go back to iPhone over here. Oh, I think that should be number three. Okay, so now let's see that. So that's how we subscribe this uh, update feature here, and also we can subscribe just another one. You can always just use the agent mechanism just there. Okay, and then we have temperature, we have humidity here, okay? That's as before. So which, which means for this particular application or observer, we only care about temperature and humidity. We don't care about pressure, we don't. And then how do we update the temperature? Easy, we just say, well, like in Java, given some new temperature T, let's update that, okay? How do we update humidity? Given some humidity H, we'll just update that, okay? Similar as before. Now, when we pass agent over here, oh, there's a small detail I wanna show you just in a moment. Okay. And then we just do display, the same as before. Okay, now let's go back to line number six over here. Okay, uh, this is a small detail I wanna show you. You might be wondering, in the case of the Java version, we had to pass this and also method handler, right? But now, in the Eiffel version, we simply say agent and then just that, okay? Why? Why do we not have to pass maybe current in this case, right? It's simply because when you actually, oh, first of all, when you say agent command, any command or any query, it simply gives you the pointer to that particular feature rather than calling that right away. You just delay that execution. Now, this line over here, over here, you can see that, you can think of this is like a feature call. In Java, if in your class you simply say, well, let me give you one example before I make my point. Let's say I got class over here, let's say point. Okay, and then let's say I have some method over here, let's say integer, attribute integer x, and then void, let's say change x to be new x, let's say that's integer, okay? If I do this in Java, if I say x is assigned to nx, in this case implicitly, when I say x over here, that really means this dot x, so this is implicit as we learn, similar in iPhone. If you didn't say anything to qualify that, that means current dot, the current objects. Okay, then let's go back. So now let's go back to this agent expression here. When I have update temperature, 
implicitly that really means current dot update temperature. Which means, which means the current object is the context objects. And Eiffel compiler is able to figure that out automatically. Okay? Okay, so now you can see that line number six, it simply means the current object is implicit. So we don't have to pass that exp explicitly. Okay, that's why you see in the Java version, we don't have a direct way of doing this. But in Eiffel we do, because we got the agent keyword over there. Okay, finally, so you can also see that I already show you. If you go back to line number eight to line number 11 in the current condition class in the Java side, you will see that that simply just corresponds to just this single line, line number six. Okay, again, it's a little bit more convenient, but they do exactly the same thing. Okay, finally, what about weather station? Okay, for weather station here, similar. So now we're gonna have current conditions here, and then we have we create a weather data here. Now, similar, when we first create the weather data, uh, the application CC over here, what it will do is, is we will try to subscribe to this particular events, right? The temperature and also the uh, humidity, okay? Same as in Java. And then when we change the measurements for the weather data, that means it's now time to publish the changes to the events, okay? So the Subscribe, subscription happens in this line in the green, and publish, uh, the publish happens in line number seven in the red. Okay, just the same as before. Okay, so now one more thing to show. In line number six, when we are trying to actually call this constructor over here for current conditions, under the hood, we actually try to say weather data, which is WD, and the events, and then we say subscribe. When what do we subscribe that to? We subscribe, Basically, the current object is simply just CC, right? That's, that's actually this or current, okay? And now in line number seven over here, what we have is we're gonna publish because we just changed the temperature to be 15. So we're gonna publish that. So we'll say the same events over here, change on temperature and then publish and 15. The only trick you gotta do is because every argument is a tuple, so you're gonna say tuple type 15, okay? And then this will invoke, again, finally, we can say CC, the current objects that updates temperature 15. Okay, it's kind of indirect. The reason that this is indirect is when we first subscribe the observer to the events, we do not call the update feature right away. We delay the execution. That's why the reference will be stored, and when the event want to call that later, it will be indirect. It wouldn't be so direct. Okay, that's uh, something for you to get used to. Okay, finally, I want to just compare one more time. Okay? Let's compare the two critical points about the difference between the IFO implementation and Java implementation. Idea, uh, conceptually, they are equivalents. This really, uh, you can ask, really say which one is more powerful, really the same. It just, in terms of the syntax, maybe one will be more compact than the other. Okay? Now, first of all, I will talk, compare from two aspects. How do we store the observers and listeners of an event? How do we store them, okay? On the, Java uh, on the Java case, we have the hash table, right? And we got the current objects, and also we got the method handle, the pointer to the method. So we got these two things to be stored. On the Eiffel side, we only get procedure already supported in the library class. It's already encapsulated into this procedure. That's the first thing to note. And the second thing is, when you want to create or pass the function pointers, also it's done differently in Java and iPhone. In the Java case, it's actually what you did, right? You gotta call the method handle and then pass all the return type, argument type, and then uh, pass uh, current reference and also the method handle. Okay, that's what you gotta do. On the iPhone side, single line, okay? You'll be fair to say in some way, it's just that for this kind of design, iPhone's type system has been thought out a little bit better than Java, just to see you can handle the things a little bit more simply. Okay. Guys, any question about the event-driven design? Okay. It seems like it took longer than I thought. Okay, but any question about this? Okay. Are we okay? Hopefully you learned something new from this, hopefully. Okay. Okay, let me, uh, do you have any question about the projects? I can also record if you got any questions. I can also try to answer that. We got five minutes. Any questions about projects? Feel free. So I can benefit everybody. 
unless it's very specific to your, your implementation. So I would suggest, since uh, it has been a one week past the project was released, I would say start as soon as possible. If you, if you haven't, um, uh, if you got trouble, do come to me. Okay, I'll help you. Okay, but you gotta come. Okay. Yes. Oh, you mean the, the final lab? Yeah. I think. <laughs> uh, guys, I, tell, uh, uh -huh. I tell you what, I, I'm not going to release lab number five this week. So I would say for, for the rest of this week, focus on your projects. Okay? For lab number five, I will either, let me stop the recording. Okay. The thing is,